So there's a lot Tennessee fans are excited about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the women's basketball, a new era for that that program, and very exciting to see how how that how that progresses. And and Darren, what are you excited about for Tennessee? Uh, I don't that that they're watching us. Is that is that or is <laughs> here out? Okay. This is my most honest Tennessee answer. You ready? It's time for the Brew and Shaver Sports Podcast. Hey, welcome back, sports fans. Thanks for joining Darren and I for another episode of the show. We're talking all things SEC as we do year-round, and there's never a dull moment in the SEC That's right. from – a uh, hot dog eating champion at the Ole Miss spring game <laughs> to the incredible one of a kind entrance of Mark Pope into Rupp Arena <laughs> on That's Sunday right. <laughs> with twenty thousand in attendance. <laughs> there is no off season. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, twenty what twenty plus thousand for a yeah. press conference. Yeah. That's normal, right? That's that's everybody does that, right? <laughs> in case we ever forgot how big a deal basketball is in Kentucky, we were reminded on Sunday. I, I think that was a clear message from the Big Blue Nation. What do you think? <laughs> Speaking of Kentucky, let's jump right in with the big Absolutely. news of their new head coach, but a familiar face to the Kentucky Wildcat mm -hmm. Big Blue Nation, Mark Pope has returned to Lexington, signing a five-year deal, $5.5 million a season. Previously, he's coached at Utah Valley, most recently at BYU. He played at Kentucky from 1994 to 1996 and was a part of that 1996 national championship team, coached by Rick Bettino. An incredible team. Absolutely. Jeff Shepard was on that team. Yep, yep. And a lot of speculation about his son, Reed. Is he mm -hmm. going to come back or is he going to go pro? Mm -hmm. Uh, and speaking of Rick Pitino, he gave a, a video endorsement to the hiring of Mark Pope. How cool was that? Uh, it's very cool. Interesting and very cool. I thought it was an awesome thing of him to do. Absolutely. For the uh, statistics, uh, Mark Pope has 187-108 coaching record. So a decent record, but yep. never won a conference title coaching a team. Never won a conference championship, tournament championship coaching a team. And never won an NCAA tournament, tournament game, tournament, tournament, tournament. <laughs> tournament. It's next level. It's next Turtle. level tournament. <laughs> never won one of those either. So there's a, a mixed bag here. He's he's a polar opposite of Calipari. Mm -hmm. But watching Sunday, the press conference, it was almost like Darren, Kentucky's going back to his roots. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And, and, you know, I will say, in spite of everything you just rattled off about not winning a, a conference championship, not winning this and that, you watch what he had to say, and I think he understands what the job is, you know, what he's there to do. Uh, I, I think he, he knows why he's there. Uh, it, it's that connection with Big Blue Nation. It's that connection with uh, that 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 storied history uh, and it, it, you know, it's interesting that we talked about Patino giving that ringing endorsement. It's a connection to kind of that style of play in that era of, of what the big blue nation or in what Kentucky basketball and the big blue nation was. So, you know, he seems to be coming in, it, coming into it with, with eyes wide open and you can't help but wish him anything but success. How cool would that be to have somebody that's from that era that played in that time come back and be successful as a coach that that would be a very very cool story it, it was something to see members of the 96 championship team come yep. off that bus yep. and to see him hand the trophy i think he handed it to Derek anderson yeah. uh before he walked onto the court mm -hmm. it was really neat to see former players come back now just because there's a there's a difference in style between Pope and Calipari. I, I think we can appreciate both of those. Certainly Calipari right. 15 years. There's a lot of good memories there that we mm -hmm. talked about last week, uh, but there was a different kind of player that Calipari coached. And most of those players, their, their goals were there. They were set on the NBA. Uh, I think one of the things that Pope emphasized was 
finding the the right guys that fit the team and guys who mm -hmm. they know it is I don't know what his words were something like the honor of a lifetime to, to wear this Kentucky jersey. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so it's just a different philosophy. Uh, we can appreciate both of them, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're different. But I think this reminds me more of, um, you know, the Patino teams and even Absolutely. Tubby, Tubby Smith Tubby. is there. Absolutely. And if you want to go back to the Joe B. Hall teams, mm -hmm. I, I think there's going to be a more, a deeper connection in that sense. Does that make sense, Darren? It, it does. And, and I think, like you said, you could hear that in his words. Uh, and, and I think he will, I, I think one of the things we'll see him immediately do is, is go toward those guys. Exactly. What we were just talking about, not necessarily shying away from NBA talent, but not, not looking at just guys that are wanting done guys, uh, guys that want to be at Kentucky, not that want to pass through Kentucky, but I also think we'll see him age and mature the team. I think it's going to be interesting to see what he does in the transfer portal. I think to go find some guys that are talented guys that might not necessarily be NBA first rounders, but can bring a lot to a team that have a couple of years of eligibility left. I, I think it'll be interesting to see where he falls with those guys in the transfer portal. I think that I could be wrong, but I think there's going to be some activity there as well. It reminded me a little bit of the Dan Hurley philosophy at Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You don't just sign guys because they're five stars. You say, who's going to fit mm -hmm. what we're trying to do here? Yep. You're, you're and, and so, elevating the program. Exactly. So w hope Mark Pope does well. Yep. Uh, he's going to be under the microscope. He's following mm -hmm. in some very big shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but hey, when Kentucky basketball is is blowing and going, uh, it just seems that that's that's how it's supposed to be, right? That's exactly right, and it and it's good for everybody in the conference. There's no disputing that. It's good for everybody in the conference. Well, transitioning from Kentucky basketball over to the Masters, the biggest golf tournament we could argue uh, uh, of the year, mm -hmm. uh, Scotty Scheffler from next door in Texas to us, 27 years old, has just won his second Masters. He won a previous one in 2022, won this one by four strokes. Uh, there's only like three guys younger than him that ha mm -hmm. have won uh, multiple at this age. So an incredible run by Scheffler. Yeah, uh, incredible run. And I tell you, that the thing that he – to me, the thing that he showcased yesterday, as much as he showcased his golf ability, was his ability to stay calm or, or cool under pressure, because that was the big dividing line yesterday. The amount of guys that got either tie, got to a tie, or within a stroke or two of him, and just fell apart. I mean, you saw, there were a couple of guys that had swings that made me go, huh, maybe I should try golf again. I don't know. <laughs> that didn't look much worse than what I do. Of course, it was just one swing that they fell apart on. It's my entire game. So that's a little bit of a different story. But you could, I mean, guys not getting balls out of bunkers, you know, miss hitting balls, you know, so far off the fairway. And, and, and it was direct result of nerves. But Scheffler, I mean, just the amount of greens and regulation that he hit and the amount of times that it, you know, it was like three wood and wedge and he's, you know, a, a short putt in for, for was just and all of it calm and cool, such an impressive run that he put together, especially in the final round yesterday to watch how he operated, how elevated his game was and how calm he stayed under pressure it was really impressive to watch. I think that's a great point, Darren. Cool under pressure. Yeah. And listening to some of his statements, he, I believe he's a man of faith. He talks yeah. about that. And so uh, that it's hard not to see a connection between the two. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you can see it. I, I think there's something to be said for, you know, you, you're talking about his statements of faith. And he said, you know, I'm going to continue to push. I'm a competitive guy. I want to win. But you know what? We've got, I think he said he had, they had another child on the way. Family's going to start, or, or a child, I can't remember if it's, you know, one, two, or three, truthfully, but but 
family is going to start to take a higher priority. I'm excited about that. Golf is still a part of my life. But the fact that those things are so aligned for him that that I think it allows him to approach even a day like yesterday. And it's like, you know what? At the end of this day, even if something were to fall apart, I, I, I still have my faith. I still am going to walk off the end of this, you know, the 18th green and, and hug my wife. I'm still going to have my kids. I think to be able to keep all of that clear as it's filtered through his faith, I think you could see that, like you said, that I, I, there has to be a connection. You could see that yesterday in everything he did. Congratulations to Scotty Scheffler for his second Masters win by the age of 27. Wow. Monday night, the WNBA draft kicked off, and it was no surprise who went number one. Caitlin Clark selected top overall <laughs> by the Indiana Fever. But it was the SEC that made an early splash in 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 the top 10 picks. Mm -hmm. We we this is ongoing right now as we're recording, but Camila Cardosa went number three overall, first SEC player taken, the center from South Carolina. Selected by the Chicago Sky. Then with the number four pick, the L.A. Sparks selected Rakia Jackson from Tennessee, powerhouse player for the Lady mm -hmm. Volunteers. And then at number seven, Angel Reese from LSU was selected by the Chicago Sky. So, wow, they're going for some size. Uh, so, so the Chicago Sky is going size and SEC. Uh, and, and, you, you know, I, I think there's also something to be said. You looked at the, the two programs not just the individual players, but the two programs they just pulled for, pulled from, they're also wanting to bring people onto their uh, roster that are accustomed to winning. Yeah. And there's two that are. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so SEC makes a big showing in the yep. first round of the WNBA draft. Awesome. Let, let's pause now for this week in sports history. April 19, 1897, the first Boston Marathon is run. John Graham, a member of the inaugural U.S. Olympic team, was inspired by the success of the first marathon at the 1896 Summer Olympics and decided to organize the event. The race was originally called the American Marathon and was the final event of the Boston Athletic Association Games. The course was 24.5 miles long and a field of 15 entered to the winner was John J. McDermott with a winning time of 2 hours and 55 minutes and 10 seconds. Oh, thank you. So evidently, We've had quite a few folks from Tennessee discover the show recently. Darren, you're the analytics guy, but you were pretty excited about this. You're also from Tennessee, even though right. you, I don't know why you don't wear orange, but don't say anything that's going to offend all these Tennessee fans. I just cringed silently. That's all. That's all. <laughs> well, I don't see a lot of Vanderbilt fans watching well, the show. I cannot dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot Tennessee fans are excited about. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the women's basketball, a new era for that that program, and very exciting to see how how that how that progresses. And and Darren, what are you excited about for Tennessee? Uh, I don't that that they're watching us. Is that is that worse? <laughs> Here, out. Okay. This is my most honest Tennessee answer. You ready? Tennessee has a lot to be excited about. Just look at, I mean, think about Josh Hype on the offense and on football, from football. As you said, a new era in women's basketball. Tony Vitello and bas baseball and what they're doing as a Vanderbilt fan, not overly excited about that. You leave baseball alone, but it's okay. It may. It, we need all the SEC teams that we can in Omaha. That's good for the entire conference. I'll take that. Uh, and then if you look at with Rick Barnes and the men's team, 
This year was their, their first, you know, the, the elevated levels they got to in the NCAA tournament. What do you not have to be excited about it right now if you're a Tennessee fan? I mean, you are just Danny Danny White. That, that's correct, isn't it? The athletic director. Danny White and that, that athletic program, man, they're clicking on all cylinders. What do you not have to be happy about? I am so impressed, Darren. <laughs> I, I don't think yes. I've ever seen you with a deer in the headlights look, but the way the way you recovered from that, impressive. Thank you, thank impressive. you, thank you. Wow. So, how do you feel about Tennessee baseball? You got anything to? Well, they uh, <laughs> they joined the rest of the SEC in beating LSU this past weekend. I think they actually swept the Tigers. That's correct. <laughs> but then again, the Tigers have lost five five straight series, first time oh, since 1977. I believe that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Tennessee baseball is looking good. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> so let's talk a little baseball here, Darren. Let's start with our top 25 poll, which pains me. Whew. But when you're three and nine in conference play, you don't deserve to be in the top 25. It is not a top 25 moment. That's right. So how about the ascent of the Aggies to the number one spot? Mm. Darren, that's, what do you think about this? Now, see, the reason I was so free to take the dig at LSU is because I could do it and it not be seen as being mean-spirited because Vanderbilt got their hat handed to them this weekend. Man, a and and, and I will say for us, we were talking about A&M very early in the year because, again, one of our points that we talked about was when you see a pitching staff, I don't care who they're playing. I don't care if it's your, your you know, your, your kid, kid brothers, you know, 10, 11, 12, 10, 10 11, 12 year old team. If, if you play somebody for three games and don't allow an earned run, your pitching staff should scare people and that's exactly where we are uh their pitching staff is just unreal and and honestly their pitching staff is at a level that it could probably it's it's kind of on that uh paul skeens kind of level that um they could they could probably that pitching staff could could carry them through uh for, for most for the most part through the season because because who's going to hit them but just in case that's not enough on any given weekend series series forget series on any given game their bats could throw out five six seven home runs depending on which pitching they're facing so you've got a staff that can a pitching staff that can hold a team to one to two earned runs or even zero on runs while the bats put eight to 12 to 15 up on you. And, and that's, again, that's what happened to Vanderbilt this weekend. And Vanderbilt came into that game ranked number six in the country. You had number two against number six and number two made number six look not like number six, not just on Friday, on Saturday and, and on Sunday. There is nothing about this A&M team that's not scary. Everything about them is scary. Every team in the SEC, if you look and see Thursday or Friday, that's who we're going to start for our three-game series. Be very afraid. <laughs> that's the only way I know to say it. <laughs> yeah, they are looking yeah. astoundingly good. Yeah, they really are. But they're not the only SEC team in the top 25. The Razorbacks are still hovering near that number one spot. Followed by the Wildcats from Kentucky, the Volunteers at Tennessee at number four, mm -hmm. Vanderbilt at 13, Alabama at 18, South Carolina at 20, and Georgia at 24. And, and we will say about South Carolina, we did mention last week that they dropped out of the top 25, had a pretty ugly series last week, then turned around this week and won uh, two out of three against Florida, knocked Florida out of the top 25, and jumped back up to number 20. Uh, which not only does that show you um, how volatile the top 25 can be at times, especially when you get to the kind of this part of the season, but that shows you the level that the SEC plays that, I mean, if you look at that swing for Florida and SEC in the process of two or Florida and South Carolina in the process of two weekend series to go in the top, out of the top, 
back in the top and not just in, but number 20. They didn't just yeah. sneak in at 25. They popped in at number 20. That shows the level of talent that week in and week out at week in and week out is fighting against each other uh, in, in baseball within the SEC. Which they do in football and yep. now in basketball. That's exactly right. And water polo, for that matter. If it's SEC, <laughs> it's strong. Let's be honest. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, they're doing it in gymnastics. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's some strong, like, uh, and I don't, that might be where my analytics end, but I mean, there's been a pretty good series of national championships from SEC schools over the last decade. Is that correct? Mm hmm. It's and don't, impressive. Don't forget softball, golf, golf, tennis. I mean, where does it end? That's, it doesn't <laughs> because it's SEC. <laughs> well, let's end by talking about spring football. We had some, some schools host their spring football games this past weekend, some others this coming weekend. So, Darren, as you look at the uh, the slate of games that we had this past weekend, what are three to four takeaways that you had from the, the spring football games? Well, we'll, we'll start with the, the obvious one. Everybody wants to talk about Alabama and, and just kind of short and sweet because uh, I'm a big believer you don't get a whole lot, you know, A game, A day, you know, black and gold game, orange and white. You just don't get it. It's all vanilla. You're just not going to get a whole lot, but you can see some fundamental stuff. Uh, and I think the big takeaway from Alabama is the offense looks good. Um, they are they're they're strong. Uh, their running game, honestly, at this point, is probably the most impressive. There is some breakaway speed in that run game from a couple of different uh, backs. Jalen Milrow actually showed some frustration at some point during the game, which is pretty interesting during a spring game. But that shows it, it was a competitive nature frustration. He wanted to do better. And, you know, that's that's the thing you want to see. Uh, so, you know, nobody expected perfection. He's learning a new offense, uh, so a new system. But but that 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 competitiveness that I want to do better, I want to make this better. That that was a, a, an awesome thing to see. Uh, so the, the offense was the big takeaway uh, from from the, the Alabama, from their A-Day running game. Is, it looks as strong as ever. looks like it's going to be an emphasis, and it looks like they're really going to have uh, some breakaway speed. Georgia just has beast everywhere. It doesn't matter who they graduated. It doesn't matter who. They just had beast everywhere, even when they're – uh, you know, their second team, in air quotes, cornerbacks are covering their first team wide receivers. It, it looked interesting. You know, it was a, it was a contested matchup with with contested cat, catches. So in, in the same in opposite, depending on which side they were on, they they're going nowhere. That's the thing. You just see the talent on the field, even in a scrimmage is just mind blowing when you watch Georgia. Uh, so, so that's another big one. You know, LSU. There were so many questions. Obviously, you come off of, of what they had last year uh, with having a Heisman Trophy winner uh, on the field. What's that going to look like? Garrett Nussmeyer looked the part. Uh, yes, it's a it's a spring game. Understand that. But as far as a grasp of the offense, having control of the ball, being able to be on target, he. He looked like he had all of those pieces and components that you want him to have to be the leader and the general on the field of your offense. So that was a big, big takeaway for LSU. Um, unfortunately, just quickly, I'll throw in, there still look to be some defensive questions, but again, getting to know the system. You, you know, there have been some changes there. That's to be expected. But as tough as last year is, that still makes you hurt a little bit. Like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that there's defensive questions. So not at so, all. So that that's but that's that's still there, but still learning the system. And I tell you that one of the big things that's going to be real interesting to watch this fall is this new Kentucky offense with their new offensive coordinator. It is Tennessee level speed. Uh they are referee puts the ball on the ground. Of course, they haven't really had a game they didn't have a televised like a big you know blue and white day or anything like that but there's been a lot of footage out there a lot of stuff on social media showing clips and and, and a lot of 
extended clips of, of, of what they're doing. And man, the, the referee puts the ball on the ground or, or the umpire puts the ball on the ground. They get up to it, call the play, and they move 20 seconds or less. It's an emphasis to hit that kind of that window of, of 20 seconds or less. And that is a dramatic change uh, from anything that we've seen out of Kentucky. Mark Stoops seems to be very excited about it. And uh, is it Brock Vandergriff, Vandergriff that transferred from uh, Georgia uh, looks strong in the system. Uh, looks like he has a grasp on it. So if I'm a um, if I'm a Kentucky fan, I'm excited about watching all of that. Um, do we want to talk about Ole Miss? <laughs> Hot dogs. <laughs> that was all the football stuff. Let me just quickly say this about, <laughs> about Ole Miss. Uh, people have kind of jumped on that and taken shots at it and, and all of these different things. And just like I said, when we started talking about the, the spring games, how much do you really learn about your team? The whole point of a spring game is to excite your fan base. Uh, I've heard some people even go as far as to say, well, he turned it into a big frat party. I, th I think that's a, a bit of a stretch. I, I don't think it, it went that far, but there was a dunk contest. There was a hot dog eating contest that featured Joey Chestnut. I think there was a, uh, a tug of war that featured maybe the offensive line versus the defensive line. And the only football action on the field was seven on seven scrimmage, basically, which is all passing the ball, deep shots downfield to me. And our, our new Tennessee fans that we just talked about, they were so excited to have listening. I, I'm going to say something positive about Lane Kiffin. Earmuffs. I don't, we don't want to offend you and run you off. So just earmuffs. Give me like 20 seconds. Just uh, is it on Spotify and iTunes? Like you hit the button and it gives you like a 15 second, 15 seconds. Go ahead and hit that. Okay. 15 seconds. You'll miss the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I think he did exactly what a spring game is. He took it and turned it into something that the, it's all about the fans, energizes the fan base, excites the, the players, sees, gets, gives, gives them an opportunity to see just how excited the fans are about them and what's going on in the program. And everybody left excited and pumped up. And you've gotten a solid, at least as of time of recording, a solid 48 hours of social media coverage out of it. I don't know what more you want out of a spring game at spring day. To me, looks like it was a pretty smart move. Yeah, people had a lot of fun. They turned out yep. uh, a great way to get fans out. Absolutely. Yep. I, I think so. Well, spring football is a sign that the college football season is drawing closer. It is drawing nigh. Is that, is that the correct use of that word? The... <laughs> we have made it past the infamous April 15th IRS day. <laughs> That's so a beautiful need, thing. <laughs> we need something to look forward to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and football is around the corner. And Omaha. Let's not forget Omaha. We got Omaha first. That's right. Thank you for joining us for another episode. Remember to hit that like, like subscribe button. Like, subscribe. <laughs> I'm having articulation issues on this particular episode. <laughs> so you get notified when new episodes come out. And any bonus episodes or shorts that we put out like we did last week about Calipari. That's right. New episodes typically drop every Tuesday morning. So you can watch us sometime on Tuesday. If you watch us on YouTube or listen to us on your favorite podcast platform, we so appreciate all of your support. Absolutely. Tell your friends, get them to subscribe. Mm. We appreciate you and we'll see you next week. Have a great week. Thank you for making the Brew and Shaver Sports Podcast your go-to sports show. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show if you haven't already. Your feedback is important. Let us know what you think about this week's show. Send an email to brewandshavers at gmail.com or text to our text line, 318-390-3599. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again for listening to the Brew and Shavers Sports Podcast. See you next week.